Good morning. When I was very little, I remember we were out on holidays out in the country area somewhere, and the sky was filled with brilliant stars. And we're standing there, my father and I, and my, probably my brothers, looking up at this night sky. And Dad was trying to point out some of the star patterns, the saucepan, the um, Southern Cross and other things. I knew what a saucepan looked like and I knew what a cross looked like, but for the life of me, I couldn't see that in the sky. He tried to point it out and he pointed and I looked up along his arm and his finger and I still couldn't see it. When Dad looked at the sky, he saw patterns. When I looked, I just saw a whole lot of flashing lights of stars flickering in the night sky. It was beautiful and wonderful, but I couldn't see what he could see. Life is, is about seeing. And as I got older, I got to the point where I could start to see those patterns in the sky. But it wasn't just the physical world, the sky, the world around us. It was life itself. As a child with childhood innocence, I, I lived in a Marvel hero comic book world. A world where there's goodies and baddies and superheroes, Santa Clauses and tooth fairies. And it was all very real and wonderful. A fantasy world that was beautiful. But as I got older, the fantasy and, and those things faded and critical thinking emerged and I learned to see what was right and wrong and true and false and truth became a, an important thing, concept. Knowing what was right and wrong and true and provable and science and all of that. It became a bit hard and welded on for a while until life intervened. And the experience of life, living and dying, experiencing death and new life, experiencing love and marriage and children and experiencing the responsibilities of life, of seeing the world in a different way, of the experiences of joy and pain, of wonder and awe and confusion and hurt, and the complexity of life of understanding some of the depth and complexity of the universe and recognizing I knew so little. And I was just a small part of this vast universe. Much of life in, is about growing and growing in awareness of, of seeing, of seeing into life and meaning and purpose, seeing deeper, more about ourselves and about the world. And, and the more I look and the more I learn to see, the more I recognise my own blindness. But, but also the, that I look through lenses, lenses of culture or ethnicity or language, languages of gender, age, life experience and experiences in life. Uh, I look through the lenses of wealth or poverty, having enough or too much or not enough. I look through the lenses of the society in which I live and the, the messages I receive in media and from people around me. I look through the lenses of faith or no faith or science or, or whatever it is that I'm interested in. I look through all sorts of lenses. And those lenses can distort and change what I see. This week our passages really deal with seeing. We come to the end of the book of Job, this, this wonderful story that tries to deal with a deep question of suffering, basically suffering in the world. Is, is suffering a punishment of God? Is, is this worldview they had of, of those who do good and right and are right with God are blessed and prosperous? Those who do evil are cursed and punished. Because the nation of Israel comes into, they're overwhelmed, they're conquered by the Babylonians and sent into exile. What have we done wrong? Does this worldview hold up? And the story wrestles with it. And Job, who is a good man, loses everything and sits on the town dump, helpless and useless and pitiful. And friends come to comfort him. But having this worldview in their mind, they say, Job, what have you done wrong? You're being punished for, for your sins, for your evil. Just own up, confess it, and all will be made well again. 
And Job is adamant, I've done nothing wrong. He wants to confront God with these deep questions, as we often do. And God is silent and absent. And the four friends three. confront Job constantly and he maintains his innocence. In the end, God makes an appearance. That's what we, we talked a bit about last week, where he says, Job, little man, little puny little man, who do you think you are? Were you here when I set the world in place and the stars in the sky and the oceans and mountains and trees and you understand the animal kingdom and all of that? You understand this universe? And finally, in this last section, Job concedes that he doesn't understand, that the world and the universe is far more complex than he ever imagined, that he only sees through his own limited experience, and his own pain and suffering. But God is much bigger. And God is mystery. And life is mystery. We can understand so much, but there's so much more we never understand. He concedes that the world is different from what he expected. But God affirms him in the end and says, Job, I don't, you know, blessing. Those who are, who are well off are not blessed by me. Those who are suffering are not cursed by me. I love you all. And, and it becomes enough for Job to live into grace to receive the fact that God is gracious and loving and is with him in the high times and in the low times. God is there and is with him and he's not judging him or punishing him. And he makes amends for his four friends and that's the end of the story. I'm not sure in our world with many who ask the questions, the hard questions of injustice and suffering, that that's enough of an answer because we like to be certain and sure and define and be in control and know the answers and have the answers we want to hear. But maybe, maybe that's all we can get. God is God. God is mystery. Life is mystery. The universe is more complex than we can ever know. We can, we can you know, make inroads into our understanding through science and, and psychology and, and sociology and all the different ologies that we have but we can never know it all and maybe knowing that God is with us and loves us that this is the message we need to hear but but there's more to it because in Mark's story this week we also come to the end of a section this section between chapters 8 and 10 where where Jesus is revealing not only who he is but what it means to follow him in the way of God, in the way of love and justice, hope and peace. The, the story, the section began with a um, blind man being healed, and this week another blind man is healed, Bartimaeus. Jesus and the disciples get to Jericho, the city, just uh, the, the stop before Jerusalem. And they go through Jericho, and there on the road to Jerusalem, this last route, there are beggars hoping that the pilgrims are now in a good mood when the end of their journey is near. And one of them is a blind man, Bartimaeus, an outcast, marginalised, he's sick, he's blind, he's, he's lowly, he's of no consequence, no significance, he is low. He's... But when he discovers who it is that's coming, he calls out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And we, we hear that this man who's blind, who can't see, actually sees more than those who have sight. And the people try, around him try and quieten him down, silence him. You're a nobody. You're a marginalised nobody. You're, you're an outcast. Shh, quiet. He doesn't want to know about you. We silence those who are different. We silence those who are crazy, say things we don't want to hear, challenges, challenge the status quo. We, ch we, we silence whistleblowers. We silence the indigenous people who, who speak out about the theft of land and culture and language. We, we silence those who, who speak out on behalf of the earth itself, suffering under the weight of, of human industry, the climate changing, the environmental crisis. We, we, we silence those who speak out on behalf of refugees and asylum seekers seeking a place that's safe for them and their family. We, we, we silence people we don't want to hear 
or who embarrass us or confront us. And the people tried to silence Bartimaeus. But he calls out all the louder and Jesus hears him and says, bring him over here. He throws off his, his beggar's cloak, the only possession he has, and comes with them to kneel before Jesus. What can I do for you? What do you want me to do for you, says Jesus? I want to see. That's his request. I want to see. And Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. But he follows Jesus on the way. And that's Mark's way of saying he's a disciple. This is what it's about. It's, it's getting your shoes on and getting in a line behind Jesus, living the life he calls you to. And in this simple little story, we hear so much of what's gone on in the last few stories, last few chapters, where, where Jesus has tried to reveal who he is. In, in, in three times he talks about getting to Jerusalem. He'll be arrested by the chief priests and elders. He'll be charged, tr tried, sent to the Romans, crucified, die and will rise on the third day. And, and all the time, the disciples don't get it. They're expecting him to come in and take charge of the city, to, to, to rally the troops, the, the armies of Israel, and to fight the Romans and drive them out and become a military king, warrior. But that's not who he is. Yeah, he's the Messiah, but he's not that sort of Messiah. And Jesus refutes him at every point. But they don't get it. The two of the disciples, James and John, want the, want the places of, of honour. They say, grant our request. And Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? As he said to Bartimaeus, give us places of honour on your right and your left. I can't do that for you. The rich man comes to Jesus and he, he wants to know what must I do to, to find this way of life in God. I know all the laws and the rules. I've done all them since I was little. What must I do? And Jesus looks into him and loves him and says, there's one thing. You, you've got to sell what you have, your properties and so forth. Give money to the poor and come and follow me. The man goes away sad and upset. He's very rich. He can't let go of what he holds. Bartimaeus lets go of his only possession to follow Jesus. But the rich man clings to his wealth and loses what he wants. The disciples argue about who's the greatest. And Jesus says, the greatest must be a servant of everyone. The last will be first and the first will be last. And this least of all, Bartimaeus, follows Jesus in to the city. He's a follower. He's first. The least is the first. And others who don't get it will ignore Jesus. In the stories, he lifts up women in a patriarchal society where women are owned by fathers and husbands, he says, no, in marriage you're equal. Men and men, women, male and female, equal. He speaks of children who are, have no rights, who are the lowest of the low. And he says, you must enter the reign of God like a child. See through the eyes of the child, through the vulnerable and the powerless, and lift them up into places of equality and welcome them. You welcome them, you welcome me, and you welcome the one who sent me. Jesus welcomes Bartimaeus, the lowest, and lifts him up into a place of equality, listening to his voice and giving him sight. And the one who couldn't see is actually the one who does see. And Mark is saying, open your eyes and turn your world upside down and follow Jesus in a way of love and justice, hope and peace. It's not the way of power and might and fame and fortune and glory. It's a way of service. It's a way of love. It's a way of creating communities that are equal and inclusive, where everyone can find their place and have hope and enough. It's a sharing of resources so that everyone has enough and no one has too much. It's to turn our world upside down. Can we see? And this is the grace of God that Job accepts, that God is with us and invites us into another way. And in the midst of life and death and joy and pain and hope and despair and, and everything life offers, God is with us and God is love. Amen.